Jordan Freed, CEO of Immutable Holdings, is back, and we'll be talking about all things cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. Jordan, welcome back to Kitco. Last time we spoke, your company had just IPO'd, or RPO'd, as we say in Canada. Your, uh, your thesis on a million-dollar Bitcoin. I'm just going to go straight into it. Does it still stand? Absolutely. I'm going to stick by that call. Uh, I think it may take, it, I, I said it last time, it's going to take time to see. Uh, but uh, Bitcoin has always been a long-term investment. You have to look at it over a long time horizon. There's been a lot of volatility since I was last on the show. I think we've seen, you know, we saw Bitcoin almost hit 70,000 and then we saw Bitcoin hit 34,000 in US dollar terms. So, yeah. You know, people have been telling me that Bitcoin is an inflation hedge. So let me just throw this scenario out. One day, Bitcoin's going to reach a million dollars. We don't know when, but let's say one day it does. But by that time, a loaf of bread's going to be a thousand dollars. So a million dollars becomes significantly less meaningful. Do you see that happening? I'm, I'm still right in that scenario, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I guess technically, yeah. You're, you're in, in that scenario where the fiat dollar is worthless. Yeah, a million. Yeah, all right, all right, makes un, sense. Un, 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 for, unfortunately, we're we're living in a world where the consumer is the one who's who's been uh, who's 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 been hurt the most. Where the people who quite literally are the backbone of the economy, the the, the workers in factories, uh, the the ones who really keep a lot of their savings or what little savings they do have in cash where, you know, we've seen inflation numbers nearing 10%. And, uh, and, and, and that's alarming. So, uh, you know, is a loaf of bread going to cost a thousand dollars? I don't know, but I can tell you a thousand dollars is worth a whole lot less today than it used to be. So, um, and, and the same for a million dollars. One of my favorite movies growing up was, it was called blank check. It's like a kid got hit by a bicycle. The guy gives him a blank check. It was a Disney movie. I think it was on Disney TV. This and is, this the seems rather things he, dark for Disney. Okay. <laughs> well, he survived. He survived the bicycle accident. But in the movie, mm. he gets a million dollars and proceeds to spend it on the most ridiculous things. He buys a limo. He hires a driver. You can't do all the things that that kid did today. I mean, you just you just can't afford it all. He buys a mansion. I mean, uh, mm. it's it's astonishing to see real estate numbers. The I, I, where I'm going with all of this is. Uh, in this economy, we need to be holding hard assets. Bitcoin is among a whole option of assets that, that someone could hold. But whether it's equities or crypto, you know, we just don't hold dollars. I, I, I think that's where we are. I'm just going to play devil's advocate because you have nobody here to debate with. Next time, I'll get you a partner to debate with. Next time, next time, Jordan. But I guess we'll right now, it. I got to play Let's the part. All right. So listen, Bitcoin is a sto okay. So if Bitcoin is going to a million dollars, I, I get that argument. Okay, you've, you've stated your thesis before, but on the point about Bitcoin, you know, you regretted buying your house with Bitcoin. Okay, well, yeah, but that's because the price went up. There's two sides of the coin. You could have, 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 you, you could have made that transaction with Bitcoin at sixty nine thousand dollars, and you wouldn't have regretted it. Now, right? The point being that <laughs> yeah. you could have been like that Rams uh, NFL Rams player. Uh, and sure. on the Rams, who you know, he he got he got uh, he got taxed on his original Bitcoin receipt, which is around seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. Sure. And then it went down. He lost all of it, and then he he netted only what thirty four thousand dollars after tax. So sure. people are people are arguing that it's really a terrible store of value based on the volatility profile. It's inconsistent as a, as an inflation hedge. As, as you brought up as a currency, it's you know maybe maybe we'll have lightning, maybe we'll have layer two protocols, maybe we won't. It, it's just bad all around. Okay, failed as a peer to peer, not consistent <laughs> as an inflation hedge, not consistent as a store of value. What is it good for, Jordan? Well, tell me how you really feel. <laughs> <laughs> These are not my thoughts. No, I'm just I, I I'm just it. spitting I, out. No, 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 no. I, I love it, and and I've, I've I've heard all the counter arguments. The truth is, I've lived the Bitcoin from 2012. I've literally lived every cycle. I've seen Bitcoin lose 80 percent of its market value in a single yes. day. I was the idiot that held Bitcoin at a thousand. I have parents that told me to sell everything, and Bitcoin crashed to 200 again. Right. I mean, the volatility of this asset is it's it's it's, it's not for the faint of heart. It is. I think the word you describe, it's it's inconsistent in how it um, how it compares to some macro economic uh, measurements. But over the right time horizon, over a long enough time horizon, this thing continues to appreciate in value. Now, why is that? Is it a Ponzi scheme? I don't think so. I think it's the greatest incentive structure ever created in human history. Ten years ago, we had zero companies, zero proper formed organizations dedicated to creating better chips to mine this asset. Right. Today, we have 
30 plus multi-billion dollar companies fighting for the right to create a better processor so they can solve a mathematical problem to add a block to the blockchain. Yeah. Intel has recently announced that they are going to be getting into the space. What we have right now is fundamentally, we have that same incentive structure, by the way, as an aside, to solving real problems like cancer or global warming or things of that nature, imagine what we could accomplish. But no, we're fighting for the right to add these blocks to the blockchain. The block reward halves, as we know, gets more and more scarce. This thing is going to a million dollars. I stand by that. I'm betting on it because I continue to hold it. And I'm a holder at any price. Now, one of the best arguments that I thought you were going to throw out there is this is going to zero. I've heard that one too, that this is going to zero. Saying that Bitcoin's going to zero is I, my, my faith is I come from a Jewish household. It's like saying Judaism or Christianity is going to zero. It's never going to happen. We're on the other side of the Rubicon. There are too many people yeah. who believe in this thing, who will believe in it at any price. So it's not going away. I think it's going to be part of our lives for the rest of our lives. Unless the government, it, well, they can't ban the network, but they can ban people from holding Bitcoin. I'm just going to throw this scenario out there. I'm not saying it's going to happen. It's a hypothetical, right? Fedcoin comes out, the government wants everybody to use their own CBDCs, which we'll talk about, and they make it illegal for people to transact with and use Bitcoin and invest in Bitcoin. Where have we seen that happen? It's in, they've done that in China. This is not science fiction. It's happening in some places around the world. Hypothetically, if every government does that, shouldn't Bitcoin go to zero? China FUD has always been one of the best bull signals I've seen every <laughs> single cycle. I've been living China FUD the entirety of you know Bitcoin's existence. Well, we're not talking Russia about China FUD, FUD anymore. FUD. We're talking about we're talking it, it, about any, any, everywhere else. Could could the U.S., for example, follow China's example? If if you prohibit the onboarding and offboarding from fiat into crypto and from crypto back into fiat, absolutely, that makes it prohibitively difficult for people to move new capital into the asset. Uh, prior to Bitcoin gaining any sort of legal status, there were these amazing stories, just like with any uh, currency. Um, that that has that has gone through uh, a similar time period. People would literally fly to Hong Kong with suitcases full of cash and a counterparty with a USB drive with some Bitcoin on, and they would swap. I think that Bitcoin is going to continue to exist. I think that the transactions will move more to a darker side of the internet where there's much more crime with it and it's much more unregulated, but it continues to be the case that governments are becoming more and more familiar with it. And isn't it fascinating that every single person, once they come to spend enough time trying to understand it, immediately becomes a believer or immediately says, yeah. hey, let's not try to stop this thing, but let's try to regulate it. Let's try to put KYC AML tools in. MUFG, the fourth largest bank in the world, led one of the largest investments into chain analysis, which actually looks at the uh, looks at the Bitcoin network. And even if you don't insert proper KYC or attach proper KYC AML, like personal identifying information to a, a particular wallet, they can figure out who you are. They've got enough. If you've ever connected or sent a transaction to a Coinbase account or a Binance account or a liquid exchange account or an FTX account, they know who you are. So we've got the tools to be able to monitor these networks. Governments are becoming more comfortable with it. The trend says the otherwise. I, I, I don't think that people are going to be looking to ban this. In fact, I fully expect it to be much more regulated um, and, 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 and adopted by governments themselves like we're seeing in El Salvador. As a technology, it just seems rather boring compared to the rest of the crypto space. Smart contracts aren't being built on it. You've got the layer one itself is not evolving. It's you're depending on layer twos to actually make any progress. I mean, I just what's the point? You know, why not yeah, just put my money 100%. in DeFi? Yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And there's wrapped Bitcoin, WBTC, which is a synthetic version of Bitcoin, essentially perfectly collateralized by Bitcoin on the Bitcoin network, custodied by a company called BitGo, which issues it to you in the form of a token on the Ethereum network, just so you can use those DeFi yield opportunities. The truth is Bitcoin is a boring asset. And I think some of the best assets mm -hmm. in the world are boring. It's a wealth preservation mechanism. Gold is boring to me. I, I don't mean to offend. I know, I know a lot of your followers are very into it. It's a boring asset. You know, okay, we can make, you know, it's a component and it's, you know, it exists as a, you know, an element that we put in, in some technology parts, but it, it largely it's a boring asset. You're absolutely right that these layer one protocols, which are more general purpose application networks like Ethereum, 
like Hedera Hashgraph, like Solana. These are much more exciting to study because these are these are proper utility networks. There's network effects, yeah. um, and you're watching Metcalf's law. These you know these networks become more useful, proportionate to the number of new users onboarded to them. These are tremendous decentralized operating systems, and uh, uh, absolutely, that part is much more exciting than Bitcoin for the sake of Bitcoin. Okay, and. Uh, financial, the traditional financial system right now, what are the problems that traditional finance has that DeFi, decentralized finance, is aiming to fix right now? Yeah, well, first, I want to access my money 24-7-365. It's funny, I missed a wire deadline to invest in a startup not too long ago. I filled out the safe documents. I owed them a quarter million dollars. I was making an investment in the company. And, uh, and they said, don't worry about it. Send us USDC. On a Saturday at noon, I sent USDC. I can't send a wire transfer there. They're closing their financing. They've got to pursue, pr they've got to approve receipt of funds. I sent them a quarter million dollars in USDC. And in fact, they preferred it. In terms of a cash and treasury management tool, Circle has rolled out a way for companies to manage cash on their balance sheet by uh, providing yield opportunities. You can get five or 6% with Circle right now, last time yeah. I checked. But in DeFi itself, if you actually move it to a protocol like Compound, or if right. you move it to a protocol like Curve, or even Anchor Finance on the mm -hmm. uh, Terra network, uh, Luna, uh, you're up to 20%. So these yields are tremendous. You have 24 seven access to your funds. If it's not your keys, it's not your crypto, but most of these protocols allow you to manage sure. your own public private key pair. That's proper control. No bank is offering that right now, and sure. that's that's what excites me the most about DeFi. Yeah, the APY is a good argument. The other argument about convenience, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on that again, just to play devil's advocate. If the uh, if the main argument here is that it's more convenient for you to access your crypto cryptos and make transactions 24/7, well, all the banks have to do to compete with that is to just make their system available 24/7, get people to work on the weekends, and upgrade their <laughs> systems to make it faster. I'm sure they can do that at some point, right? And then that yeah, nullifies it's, the it's, argument. It's, it's funny, I'm crypto native, but we decided to take our company Immutable Holdings public, uh, shameless plug, we're ticker HOLD, we went public sure. in your country, in sure. Canada. And it's funny, I remember after going public, I remember being Friday and market closes, right? Market closes 4 p.m. And I remember thinking, wow, this is actually kind of nice. You know, the markets close is a little bit of a break. We've never had that in crypto, but that's a feature of crypto, the 24-7, 365 liquidity. Yeah. Bitcoin's traded on Christmas. Uh, you know, uh, the Canadian stock market is closed on Boxing Day, right? It's mm -hmm. just, you know, having access to capital markets. And now we even have versions of stock that is perfectly liquid, 24-7, 365 on public blockchains. Mm -hmm. where these are synthetic assets that are being issued, collateralized maybe in the form of stock or, or maybe it's a token that's meant to be pegged to the value of a particular uh, equity. But it's fascinating to see uh, the problem being solved, which is what if we just had 24-7, 365 access to our brokerage accounts, to our checking accounts, to, um, you know, to, to, to the places where we keep our wealth. I think that's important. I don't see the banks moving in that direction. Okay. I think there's, they're too slow and there's too much regulatory compliance. Um, you know, you, you, gotta, you gotta get the regulators to allow the stock market to stay open past 4 p.m. Okay, don't pretend that your friends haven't asked you this next question. Jordan, what's the next coin that's gonna 5X or 10X next year? So, I don't, you know. Not investment, <laughs> I know what you're gonna say, not investment advice, uh, not financial gotta, advice. Gotta, I've, let me I've, reframe, I've give, let me yeah. reframe my question. Protocols with the best potential for growth. Yeah, so I'll answer it this way. 2020 was the year of DeFi. 2021 was the year of NFTs. We purchased NFT.com before anyone thought NFTs were going to be something and that domain is worth 25 times more than what we paid for it. And it's not for sale, right? DAOs, this is the year of DAOs. What we are seeing happen with decentralized autonomous organizations, it's mm. really at its core, just a different org structure, like a limited liability company or like an S corp or like a C corp. A DAO is a way to run an organization, but these DAOs that are forming are tremendous. And we have really big DAOs right now. Uniswap operates like a DAO. It's you know fully diluted, worth over $10 billion. I think probably even maybe double that, uh, where if you hold the token and you're a constituent of that ecosystem, you have a voice. You can help move it in a proper direction. Uh, there's other really great examples where uh, LinksDAO, which uh, uh, in full disclosure, I did buy the global membership, but there was a group of people on Twitter that came up with this crazy idea to launch a membership 
to a virtual golf course, or to a golf course that doesn't exist, and to use the proceeds of that virtual membership to buy a golf course. It's called okay. LinksDAO, and there's a membership there that is not financial advice, but that's fascinating. That's absolutely yeah. fascinating to have a membership to a, a golf course that doesn't exist, and then the proceeds there. So I believe that where the most value creation is going to happen in 2022 and beyond is in people launching DAO-based projects. LinksDAO launched, I believe, just at the very end of last year, beginning of this year. So that's one I'm watching. Friends with Benefits is another really interesting DAO, as well as uh, the Bankless community. I've got to give a shout out to all of those. But most of the major NFT projects, Board Apes, World of Women, even the Doodles, shout out to the Doodles, guys. Those blue chip projects are starting to govern themselves like a DAO. We're owning an ape, we're owning a doodle, we're owning a world of uh, woman NFT allows you to participate in making decisions for the community. That's such a powerful shift uh, to how traditional organizations run. And I think there's going to be a lot of value capture there. I've got to bring up this article that my friend sent me. I'm not going to name him, but he, if he's watching, he knows who he is. All right, this is from CNBC. I'm just going to read the headline. Owning cryptocurrency may make you more desirable on the dating scene, study science. Okay, I'm just going to read the caption to this. I'm not, this is not my headline. Um, to that point, 33% of Americans said that they would be more likely to go on a date with someone who mentioned crypto assets in their online dating profile. Further, nearly three in four would be more interested in a second date with a person who paid the bill in Bitcoin. Where can I, where, where, how can you even do that? Uh, according to a recent survey by eToro, social investing platform, this is my friend's response, okay? And I want you to respond to his response. He says, what is this garbage? Replace crypto with having one million, a lot of money, private jet, yacht, anything that is value, and you get the same answer. <laughs> well, I think a lot of crypto kids have paid for their private jets and yachts with their cryptocurrency. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, you, you're going to have to forward me that article because I'm going to have to show it to my wife every time she finds it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're already married. It doesn't apply. Yeah. But it's true, right? I mean, what, 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 what is the sentiment coming from that, uh, that all of a sudden you've got... At the end of the day, wouldn't you be more attractive if you own hard assets like gold, okay? Things that are fungible, oh, not fungible, things that are tangible rather. A private jet has utility, I can fly somewhere. A yacht, those are all, you know, traditional measures of wealth. Uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, just because you own crypto doesn't make you rich, right? I, I, can, oh, I, can, I can tell you that I'm rich if I have a private jet just because I have crypto. Listen, I mean, I there's have... a lot of people who, there's a lot of people who put 20 million dollars in Bitcoin at its peak and it's now worth, you know, it's worth 15 or it's worth 12. Right. So uh, there's 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 a lot of people who are, whose portfolios are still underwater in that they came in and bought the peak. I think I think really this is emblematic of the trend, which is crypto is becoming progressively one more mainstream and two cool. It's just cool. Web3 solves a lot of problems. If you look at the growing sentiment, I really think I would describe it as in Web2, the people who own the platforms are the ones who accrue the most value, right? And to quote Batman for a second here, you either die the hero or live long enough to see yourself become a villain. We've seen Mark Andreessen, one of the most successful investors of our lifetime, get into Twitter fights with Jack Dorsey over this whole notion of Web3. But really what Web3 is all about is users and participants in ecosystems capturing value and building wealth where there's more equitable access to the value creation that happens if you're early to a platform. Yeah. If you put a quarter million dollars into Binance token, when Binance first launched and you were loyal to that platform, you'd have a couple hundred million dollars right now, right? Uh, the same is the yeah. case with crypto.com and FTX. These platforms are architect in a fundamentally different way. Web two, it was cool, right? You know, we saw the social network movie, Zucks was cool, but what's even cooler right now is building a Web3 DAO-based ecosystem where all of your users get to share in the value capture that's happening. Web3 is real, I think it's exciting. I'm down with this. I'm happy that I'm happy that that crypto guys are uh, are having success in the dating world. <laughs> how do you? How do you okay, one more comment. We'll end it here. How do you feel about the metaverse? Okay, because it, it, properties in the metaverse. Well, not properties. The metaverse hasn't really. But virtual properties, virtual products, virtual. Uh, I was I was listening to the Impulsive podcast. Virtual boats, yachts are being sold for eight hundred fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars now. Um, it's crazy. This is a comment from my friend. I asked him, "What do you think about the metaverse? What would, would you buy property in the metaverse?" He says, "At that point, let me buy. Let me. Yeah, you know, there's the same guy who didn't like uh, didn't like uh, uh, crypto crypto 
goes into dating. So he said, at that point, let me buy beach house uh, property in Malibu, and when the girl asks me to take her there, I'll specify that my property is in the metaverse. <laughs> That's, your friend's really funny. I want to meet him. <laughs> Maybe the yes. next time I'm in Montreal, if he's if he's in town. Yeah. So the the, the trend's not reversing it's all anytime fake, soon, right? It's just it's just it's it, just it virtual is, stuff. It is. But let's but let's walk through it a practical example. We as humans are spending an unbelievable amount of our time in a digitally connected world, and it's an increasing amount of time. That trend is not reversing anytime soon. Kids are on iPads all day long. You're connected to an Apple Watch. You're connected to a phone. Because we're spending so much time online in the traditional world, someone would come into your office, your studio, and see all of your fancy credentials, your diploma hanging on your wall, all the nice little trinkets that you have on your desk and everything you've accumulated. Maybe they'd see it on your coffee table in your apartment or your home. It shouldn't be surprising that someone's spending $4,000 in a Gucci bag in the game Roblox, right? If you're walking around with swag down Fifth Avenue or, you know, uh, shopping in the West Village in New York, you want to be seen and you want to be seen with, you know, what that says about you. If you're walking around the metaverse, you're spending eight hours a day playing Roblox, you probably want people to know that, you know, you probably want people to know what your avatar says about you as well. So we shouldn't be shocked that people are spending a tremendous fortune on virtual real estate, on skins, on tangible assets. That's not going anywhere. We are one going to continue to spend more and more of our time connected as that user experience becomes better. And I think virtual real estate, one, it's a bubble right now, like any traditional real estate bubble, but two, virtual real estate will have value you long term but the caveat on that is you have to have the right virtual real estate in the right metaverse there will be many metaverses there will be many communities is it going to be the sandbox is it going to be decentraland is it going to be axe infinity that's a risky bet right now those could be alta vista or yahoo to a google that's still coming we don't yet know listen i I, all i'm going to say is uh if i have limited capital and i'm you know on a date and i say to the girl i own cryptocurrencies and she's like all excited she wants to come back home with me and i say to her look i don't actually have property physical property i have it in the metaverse nothing's gonna happen that night that's all i'm gonna say (laughs) (laughs) i uh yeah i don't disagree with that i don't disagree with that at all (laughs) all right well i'm looking forward to seeing uh, you in the metaverse jordan thank you so much before we let you go Tell us about Immutable Holdings, any updates since you IPO'd, we spoke last time. What are the company updates investors need to be uh, looking out for right now? Yeah, I, I couldn't be more excited. We went public, David, in Canada to take uh, to, to democratize access to, uh, to, to our equity. Uh, we went public to democratize access to good blockchain equity. It shouldn't just be the Andreessen Horowitz's um, and you know the Chamath Pala Habitias that have access to the seed rounds of companies like OpenSea and Coinbase. We are building web free businesses in the public um, on a public capital market, which means that retail can participate. Not investment advice, do your own research, consult your financial advisors, all the proper disclosures. But we're so excited to have a true Web3 venture studio and blockchain holding company on a Canadian capital market. Canada is amazing. God save the queen. It's a tremendous place for entrepreneurs and we're in a very entrepreneurial exchange, the NEO, where we can do the sort of things like build NFT.com and take it to market. Stay tuned. That's launching just within the next couple months. All right. Well, we'll get you back for an update when that happens. Thank you so much, Jordan, for coming on the show today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lynn. Stay tuned for more.